pepper, cardamom, cinnamon, nutmeg. All during the Middle Ages, Europe was gripped by a fascination for the spices that came from far off Asia. The spice route controlled by Arab traders crossed the Indian Ocean and Asia Minor before reaching the shores of the Mediterranean. The spices were then sold to Venetian merchants who would then resell them throughout Europe where they were worth their weight in gold. With their routes to the east controlled by the infidels, Christian Europe sought out new maritime routes to reach the oriental spice gardens. The Portuguese set out for the east. Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope and reached India on the 23rd of May, 1498. A few years earlier, the historic voyage of Christopher Columbus in 1492 was considered a failure by the Spanish sovereigns who had hoped to reach the riches of India. In 1520, Magellan succeeded in finding a western passage to Asia. Without realizing it, he had written the first chapter of an incredible maritime adventure that lasted right into the beginning of the 20th century, when the last commercial sailing ships, the Cape Horners, were finally taken out of service. has been the scene of hundreds of shipwrecks. In the 19th century, the men who embarked on the huge ships sailing between Europe and Asia were well aware of the dangers that the voyage entailed. But what about the first navigators that came here? What about Magellan? He was, of course, a very brave seaman, an important navigator. His name has lived on down through the centuries from 1520 down to the present day. Several centuries have gone by and here you are talking to me in my cabin. But the man whose name you pronounced is still present in our memory. He lives on. On the other hand, uh, apart from Pigafetta, the Italian chronicler who embarked with him, we don't know anything at all about the brave men who were along with Magellan on his voyage. Monday, the Feast of St. Lawrence, August 10th, 1519. The army supplied with all that was necessary, with a crew composed of 237 men from different nations aboard five ships, were ready to cast off from the pier of Seville. Firing all our cannons, we sailed under only our foresail to the mouth of the Guadalquivir. This is how Antonio Pigafetta described his departure from Seville in the Old World on board Magellan's Carac. The 15th of December, 1519, the fleet reached Rio de Janeiro. Then, after a stopover of several months in the land of the Patagons, the Giants, Magellan came in sight of the strait. After sailing and having reached the 52nd degree of the previously mentioned Antarctic Sea, we, as if by miracle, came upon a strait that we call the Cape of the 11,000 Virgins. The captain sent two ships ahead, the San Antonio and the Conception, on reconnaissance to seek out the exit of the strait. They took three days to go and come back, and they told us that they had found the Cape and the vast open sea. And the captain, overcome with joy, began to weep, and he named the Cape, Cape Desire for it was desired so deeply and for so long. Wednesday, the 28th of November, 1520, we sailed out of the strait and into the Mar Pacifica. In the wake of Magellan, the southern tip of America was to become the scene of four centuries of incredible maritime adventures, marked by exploits as well as shipwrecks. In the 19th century, the men who sailed for Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego were no longer adventurers or explorers, but simple sailors in charge of handling the gigantic sailing ships loaded with wool, copper, or immigrants. These men were the Cape Horners. I'm a bit hesitant about what the title Cape Horner really means. For me, a Cape Horner is somebody who goes by sailing ship from east to west. I'd like to emphasize just how difficult it actually is to go from east to west, because you have the seas against you, the waves constantly from the west, from the Pacific, you're also sailing into headwinds. 
so you're up against all these elements. That took time and there were people who lost their lives at it. Victims of the hostile elements unleashed around Cape Horn, the men pray, sing, and drink to keep their fear at bay. They have but one thought in mind, to reach Valparaiso. Up until 1914, with the opening of the Panama Canal, when all of a sudden there was no more need for the long voyages around South America, Valparaiso incarnated the spirit and dreams of all the Cape Horners. Roused from its slumber by the sirens of the boats moored in the harbor, Valparaiso slowly emerges from the morning mists. All during the 19th century, Valparaiso, the first port after rounding the Cape Horn, harbored hundreds of sailing ships. The town drew European captains, welcomed immigrants. It even became more important than Santiago, the capital of Chile, until it was abandoned in a far corner of the earth by the steamers that from 1914 on set their course for the Panama Canal. So Valparaiso, the Valley of Paradise, grew along with the activity of its port. The city's funiculars, often in a sorry state now, date back to those days. The inhabitants still use them to go home to their working class neighborhoods, where once stood splendid colonial mansions. In spite of this decline, the city continues to intrigue and attract sailors and travelers. The mere mention of Valparaiso evokes the legends of the sea and the mythic Cape Horners. Valparaíso has always attracted sailors. Why is that? Well, after a long trip aboard these large sailing ships at the time, when the sailors would come into this semi-developed port city, they would be able to go ashore if the captain authorized it. There were beautiful women, good Chilean wine, and so this was really a pleasant stopover. And all the old-time sailors that put in here have warm memories of Valparaíso. And even the sea chanties, the old sailing songs, talk about Valparaíso as an ideal spot, a good place to come after a long sea voyage. Valparaiso is not only part of the living memory of the Cape Horners, it incarnates the history of the Chilean Navy as well. After the War of the Pacific against Peru and Bolivia, the victorious Chilean Navy became one of the cornerstones of the nation. Scattered all over the country are monuments commemorating the heroes of that war and their leader, Captain Arturo Prat. In the Naval Club, we met with two delightful ladies. The history of the Cape Horners is part of their life, for their father, Henry Merkens, was captain of the Isbeck. When this German captain sailed into Valparaiso in 1914, after rounding Cape Horn, war broke out and his ship was requisitioned. But he stayed in Chile, married, and was named once again captain of his large sailing ship, which overjoyed his children. Dad was at home only during the vacations. The rest of the time, he was mostly out at sea. I think the happiest time of our life was when we were out sailing. 
It was a thousand times better than the steamers because of all the noise from the motors. On the sailing ships, all you feel is the wind and the rocking. We'd pass the time watching the foam to feel the speed of the boat. As we were kids, we could fish off the stern. We waited all year for the moment when we'd embark on the ship. It was really wonderful for us. Chile, a maritime country, stretches over more than 4,300 kilometers, from the Peruvian border to the Tierra del Fuego. Yet it wasn't until the middle of the 19th century that Chile began to take an interest in its southern provinces. The first attempts at colonization had began a long time before. The Spanish, who wanted to protect the strait, decided to send down the most impressive fleet ever assembled. 3,000 men and 23 ships under the orders of Sarmiento de Camboa, the governor of the Strait of Magellan. Desertions, shipwrecks, when the expedition sailed into view of the strait on the 2nd of February, 1584, there were only 529 men and four ships left. In spite of it all, the colony was founded, as Sarmiento relates in his logbook. The 25th of March, 1584, by the grace of God and in the name of the Most Holy Trinity, Pedro Sarmiento chose his counselors and established the town council and confirmed them in the name of Your Majesty. Then he chose the site of the Tree of Justice and laid the plans of the town, which he then christened Rey Don Felipe. Victims of famine and cold, none of the colonists left by Sarmiento survived, and the town of Rey Don Felipe is remembered under the name of Port Famine. It was three centuries later before another attempt was made to colonize the Tierra del Fuego. In 1843, just a few kilometers from the site of Port Famine, the Chileans founded Fort Bulnes. Today, in its place, there is a faithful reconstruction. A few years later, the inhabitants decided to move their small community to a more favorable location, Sandy Point, or Punta Arenas. Punta Arenas, which was a penal colony when first founded, is now the capital of Chilean Patagonia. Punta Arenas, with its 120,000 inhabitants and its colorful houses, is wedged in between the Strait of Magellan and the wide open Patagonian plains broken up by the last foothills of the Andes. Punta Arenas, far removed from the world's great cities, and proud of it. Now it draws an increasing number of tourists eager to discover Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego, and the Antarctic further south. In the 19th century, Punta Arenas was a port of call for the clippers that preferred to brave the changing currents and winds of the Strait of Magellan than the storms of Cape Horn, and it developed as the region's natural resources were exploited. First whaling and seal hunting, and more recently oil, natural gas and coal. But the principal resource of the city remains sheep raising. And even more than Magellan, whose statue thrones in the middle of the Plaza de las Armas, the real hero of Punta Arenas is Jose Menendez. This Spanish Chilean owned a three million hectare ranch. He went into partnership with another immigrant, Moritz Brown, a Russian, and together they owned over one billion hectares.
The former Brown Menendez Mansion, which is now a local history museum, is the symbol of a success story. In 1906, Punta Arenas was, even more so than today, a remote outpost. And yet, Italian marble, English furniture, and wallpaper, nothing was too fine, too expensive to show off the power and riches of these two sheep barons. During the 19th century, Chile encouraged European immigration to fill the needs of the developing South. Germans, Italians, French, and particularly Croatians came to settle in Punta Arenas. In the cemetery, these colonists from all over the world lie beside the mausoleums of the powerful cattle-raising families. The Indians, driven from their lands by this new wave of colonization and the spread of cattle raising, fell victim to famine and disease. Feelings of guilt? A heartfelt homage? A mystical rite? This statue of a little Indian is an object of devotion for the inhabitants of Punta Arenas. At first, about 10 years ago, the statue was at the entrance of the cemetery. But there were so many people that they decided to move it over here. That was about four or five years ago. People come to thank the Indian for the wishes that he has granted, whether it be for professional, financial, or even domestic problems. The first thing they do when they come is to light a candle. Some leave money. They touch the Indian's hand. They say a prayer. Then they go home at peace with themselves. We feel sadness and heartache at having lost this culture, about not knowing more about these people that were here before us, in this all but forgotten region of Patagonia. We studied about the Indians in school, but it was so little. We learn about the wars, we learn about independence, but they never really go into the question of the Indians that used to live here in Patagonia. The Mare Australis sets out leaving Punta Arenas behind. During the southern summer, this Chilean cruise boat explores the fjords and channels of the Cerro del Fuego. And on board, we continue our voyage in the wake of Magellan, Sarmiento, Francis Drake, and all of the great navigators who, over the centuries, have contributed to our knowledge of these far-off lands.
The red glow of dawn outlines the silhouette of the Isla Magdalena, which floats like a mirage on the waters of the Strait of Magellan. Every year between September and March, close to 60,000 pairs of penguins congregate here to nest, an intriguing mystery of nature. For how long have they been coming here to celebrate this ritual of life? We don't really know just when the penguins started coming here to nest, but we do know that Antonio Pigafetta, who came here with Magellan's expedition, talked about the penguins, which he described as wild geese. We don't know why the first penguins chose this island to nest, but season after season, it's become the rule. And year after year, the same penguins return here to mate. In the 1960s, it became a national park, so it's protected by the state. Given its size, it's truly a natural monument. It's just this island and the next one over there that our state preserves because of the nesting penguins. Unlike other species of penguins, the Magellan penguins build their nests underground. They lay their eggs there, which hatch 60 days later. Antonio Pigafetta, confronted with this totally unknown species, describes them as follows. It would be impossible to estimate the number of these wild geese for we loaded all five ships in just one hour. These wild geese are black and covered all over with feathers. They do not fly and live on fish. They were so fat that instead of plucking them, we skinned them. The sea wolves of these two islands are of several colors, and they are as big as calves. They have heads like calves and small rounded ears. They have long teeth, no legs, but attached to their body they have feet that look like human hands with small nails and skin between the toes like geese. And if these animals could run, they would be dangerous and cruel, but they don't leave the water, they swim and live on fish. Leaving the Isla Magdalena, we head south and enter into the channels that lead to the Alberto Agostini National Park. We are navigating on the main channels. They're well marked, the positions, the depths, and the position of the rocks as well. All this has been done just in the last 30 years. When I started about 50 years ago, we had to take our bearings from the natural landmarks, the mountains, 
a cliff face. Back then, they didn't have any channel beacons. In the early 19th century, with the beginning of the industrial age and before steamships came into their own, the English were in search of shorter maritime routes to reach their far-off colonies in Asia and the South Seas. And thus Captain Fitzroy discovered a new channel to the south of the Strait of Magellan, which he named after his ship, the Beagle. On board was a young English scientist of 22, Charles Darwin. Before reaching the Galapagos Islands, where his theory of the evolution of species would take form, the voyage of the Beagle took Darwin to the Tierra del Fuego. January 19th in the afternoon, we entered the eastern mouth of the channel and shortly afterwards found a snug little cove concealed by some surrounding islets. The next day, the 20th, we smoothly glided onwards in our little fleet and came to a more inhabited district. Few, if any of these natives, could ever have seen a white man. Certainly nothing could exceed their astonishment at the apparition of the four boats. January 29th. Early in the morning, we arrived at the point where the Beagle Channel divides into two arms, and we entered the northern one. The scenery here becomes even grander than before. The lofty mountains on the north side compose the granite axis, or backbone of the country, and boldly rise to a height of between three and 4,000 feet, with one peak above 6,000 feet. They are covered by a wide mantle of perpetual snow, and numerous cascades pour their waters through the woods into the narrow channel below. In many parts, magnificent glaciers extend from the mountainside to the water's edge. It's scarcely possible to imagine anything more beautiful than the berry-like blue of these glaciers. The soundings and readings taken by Fitzroy were so accurate that they're still used on today's sailing charts. As for the landscapes described by Darwin, they've hardly changed since the beginning of the 19th century, except perhaps for the size and location of the glaciers. This is the Condor Glacier, which is part of the Alberto Agostini National Park. It's about 90 meters high and 100 meters wide. There are at least 50 or 60 glaciers that flow down from the ice fields in different directions. To the north, some of them flow towards the Seno Almirantazgo, and in the south, most of them flow into the Beagle Channel. That's where there are the most. According to certain indications, we think that two or three hundred years ago, glaciers covered this whole region. It's probable that in the 17th century, these glaciers touched the part of Lake Agostini and even stretched as far as the region of the Magdalena Channel and even beyond that into the Strait of Magellan. And about a hundred years ago, they began to shrink back very quickly. They receded so quickly that the glaciers freed areas that until then had been covered in ice to a depth of 800 meters, and all that in the last 100 or 200 years. Magellan, Sarmiento, Cavendish, Fitzroy, Darwin. 
Century after century, the enthusiasm that drew navigators and scientists again and again to explore the Tierra del Fuego continued unabated. In 1882, under the auspices of the International Polar Year, an expedition christened Cape Horn Scientific Mission embarked aboard the three-master La Romanche. Under the orders of Captain Martial, they crisscrossed the labyrinth of the Fuegan channels. In memory of this expedition, certain glaciers lining the Beagle Channel were named after the countries represented on board La Romanche. German glacier, French, Italian, Holland, This whole area was covered with glaciers 40,000 years ago. And before that, 80 million years ago, there was a collision of three continental plates, the Antarctic plate into the South American plate, and between these two, a third little-known tectonic plate, the Scotia plate. The uplifting resulting from this collision produced mountains, and some of them are two to 3,000 meters high. Then, 40,000 years ago, they were covered in ice. This whole area was covered with a layer of ice more than 2,000 meters thick. Those glaciers would advance at an incredible speed, between 30 and 40 meters a day, and so they would gouge out channels in a very violent and aggressive way. Around 12,000 years ago, they began to melt and recede. The sea flowed into the space that was freed up and continued to advance to its present position, producing very narrow fjords and channels, two to three kilometers wide, but several hundred kilometers long. La Romanche was on a scientific mission to make magnetic and meteorological observations, but it also carried out ethnological and anthropological studies. The accounts describe the encounters with the Yamana villages in the southern part of the Tierra del Fuego. The Mare Australis is coming into Puerto Williams. Puerto Williams, Ushuaia's rival for the title of southernmost city of the American continent, is situated in the heart of the former Yamana territory.
Here on the Isla Navarino is where Fitzroy embarked four young Yagans, another name for the Yamanas, on the first voyage of the Beagle. Fitzroy, convinced of the righteousness of his mission and his moral rectitude, wanted to instill in these natives the principles and values of an English education. When he brought them back along with Darwin two years later on the second voyage of the Beagle, one of the Yamanas, nicknamed Jemmy Buttons by the sailors because he had been traded for a mother of pearl button, immediately took up his old ways. That was almost two centuries ago, and the Yamana culture was thriving. Today, it has completely disappeared. However, certain rumors tell of a woman living in the little village of Okika near Puerto Williams. It's said that she's the last authentic Yamana living in Tierra del Fuego. And yet in Ukika, none of the inhabitants that we questioned claim the slightest bit of Indian heritage, a sort of fatality, the deep black hole of oblivion. I'm Chilean. Chilean because I'm like my mother, who I grew up with. Everything has changed since those old days. All the kids are mixed breed. The parents are mixed, their father, my husband, they're all mixed breed. The only ones that are true Indians are those two sisters. They're true Indians. Nothing mixed about them. They are Ursula and Cristina. On the day we arrived, Ursula, the last Yamana, died in a hospital at Puente Arenas. The first Indians reached Tierra del Fuego around 10,000 years ago after a long migration. Onas, Alakaluf, Yagans, and a few other ethnic groups all lived on this territory. Wulaya was most likely the center of the Yamana culture. Most of the Yamana colonies were probably located in this area. The Yamana were nomads. They'd move from place to place along the channels in canoes, rather fragile canoes. They were fishermen, and they also hunted sea lions. They lived off the resources of the sea to a large extent. When they landed in a bay, they would stay 12 to 15 days to stock up on supplies. Then, when they needed food again, they would move on to another bay to find provisions. The women would gather shellfish. When they camped in a place like Wulaya here, they'd eat the shellfish and leave the ground littered with the empty shells. So all through this whole area you can find the leavings of their meals. Then they'd build their huts. They'd cross two branches to form a hemisphere. Then they would cover them with sea lion pelts and foliage.
Located on the north side of the Beagle Channel, almost opposite Puerto Williams, Ushuaia is in the Argentinian part of Tierra del Fuego. It's a town of 300,000 inhabitants with a mixture of architectural styles and no particular charm. Like all the towns of the region, Ushuaia is a pioneering town and was founded fairly recently, at the end of the 19th century. Ushuaia, visited by tourists, curiosity seekers and true nature lovers, has no real interest except as a jumping off point for the wide open spaces of Tierra del Fuego. It was here, in this landscape buffeted by the Patagonian winds, that in the 19th century, Pastor Thomas Bridges decided to found his Estancia Harberton. Along with the everyday activities of a ranch, Thomas Bridges pursued his overriding passion, the study of the Amana culture, and in particular, their language. He is the author of an almost 30,000 word dictionary. The natives, the, um, the native Indians, the Yamana or Yagan, most of them lived in canoes, were nomadic people along the coast. Uh, they hunted, they lived mainly on fur seals was their main food, but also birds and mussels and things. But the fur seals had been mostly depleted, uh, killed off by the sealers and it was very difficult for them to find enough food. So one of the things Thomas Bridges tried to do was to teach them to grow vegetables, potatoes, and rutabaga and other vegetables, and to begin uh, with animals, with cattle and sheep, so they would have more food. He was most interested in the language. And so he spent many years uh, studying and revising and, and recopying uh, his dictionary, which was eventually published, English Yagan Dictionary. He was able to speak with them very well. During almost a century, the only maritime route connecting Europe and Asia was the Strait of Magellan. In the early 17th century, the Dutch took over the control of the spice trade from the Portuguese. They founded the Dutch East India Company and banned all free trade ships from using the Strait of Magellan or the Cape of Good Hope to reach the Spice Islands. Schouten and Le Maire, two Dutch traders, decided to quite legally circumvent this prohibition by seeking out an alternate route to the Strait of Magellan. The 31st of January, 1616, they rounded the Cape further south. They christened it Cape Horn in honor of their hometown, Horn. Schouten and Le Maire thus opened the commercial route that all the Cape Horners would use from then on.
En los tiempos de la navegación a la vela, los capitanes... Back in the sailing days, the captains were very qualified, very competent professionals. There's no question about it. Y sobre todo para venir al Cabo de Hornos, the ship owners naturally chose the most highly qualified to sail the Cape Horn. On the other hand, they were much less demanding when it came to recruiting the crews. The crews were usually recruited in bars, in the ports. Sometimes they were enrolled by force. And the crew was small. For economic reasons, the crew would number no more than 40 to 44 men, so they couldn't carry out maneuvers on more than one mast at a time, and that entailed a certain risk. A rare privilege, we set foot on Cape Horn. But we are not the only human beings on this site. A representative of the Chilean Navy lies here with his wife. Beyond the horizon lies only the Antarctic, and before us the ocean stretches out as far as the eye can see. The wind here is always at least 40, 50 knots. We've had winds of 100 to 120 knots, and for here that's normal. The swell can get very big. There are sometimes very high waves, between 4 and 10 meters. That's what the sea's like here, very stormy. It's a bit scary. It's scary because we're afraid of getting swept away. The whole house shakes. It's as if the wind wanted to carry it off. You know, I think Hector has given me a lot of strength. I know that if something were to happen to me, the only person who would be able to help me would be my husband, and vice versa. Anyway, we have our ups and downs. But I can't say we have any real problems. My best memory, apart from a personal and spiritual aspect, is God's blessing. The fact that he protects us all year round, so nothing happens to us. Another fond memory is the friendly relationships with the people that come to visit us here. Yes, I have fond memories of things like that. There'll usually be 10 to 15 freighters a day going by here. My job is to control the maritime traffic of this whole sector, of the whole ocean. You get all kinds of boats coming through here. You even get yachts. And I can hardly ever sleep the whole night straight through because we always have boats coming through, sailboats. They need our help for the meteorology, to find out what the weather is like in this sector, and we're ready to help them out and give them the support they need. The heaviest traffic took place around 1850 when they discovered gold in California. They say in one year, about 700 ships came through here. They would sail from New York, for example, 
They would round Cape Horn towards Valparaiso, where they'd put in for a time. Then they would continue their voyage onto San Francisco in California. Then, for different reasons, the sailing traffic declined over the years. The main reason was the construction of the Panama Canal. So from 1914 on, the traffic declined. And in the 1950s, the traffic of the sailing ships stopped completely. Pepper, cardamom, cinnamon, nutmeg. All during the Middle Ages, Europe was gripped by a fascination for the spices that came from far off Asia. The spice route controlled by Arab traders crossed the Indian Ocean and Asia Minor before reaching the shores of the Mediterranean. The spices were then sold to Venetian merchants who would then resell them throughout Europe where they were worth their weight in gold. With their routes to the east controlled by the infidels, Christian Europe sought out new maritime routes to reach the oriental spice gardens. The Portuguese set out for the east. Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope and reached India on the 23rd of May, 1498. A few years earlier, the historic voyage of Christopher Columbus in 1492 was considered a failure by the Spanish sovereigns who had hoped to reach the riches of India. In 1520, Magellan succeeded in finding a western passage to Asia. Without realizing it, he had written the first chapter of an incredible maritime adventure that lasted right into the beginning of the 20th century, when the last commercial sailing ships, the Cape Horners, were finally taken out of service. has been the scene of hundreds of shipwrecks. In the 19th century, the men who embarked on the huge ships sailing between Europe and Asia were well aware of the dangers that the voyage entailed. But what about the first navigators that came here? What about Magellan? And at colonial mansions. In spite of this decline, the city continues to intrigue and attract sailors and travelers. The mere mention of Valparaiso evokes the legends of the sea and the mythic Cape Horners. Valparaiso has always attracted sailors. Why is that? Well, after a long trip aboard these large sailing ships at the time, when the sailors would come into this semi-developed port city, they would be able to go ashore if the captain authorized it. There were beautiful women, good Chilean wine, and so this was really a pleasant stopover. And all the old-time sailors that put in here have warm memories of Valparaiso. And even the sea chanties, the old sailing songs, talk about Valparaiso as an ideal spot, a good place to come after a long sea voyage. 
vous annoncer que la terre est proche de quelques mille. Malgré l'eau, le vent est bon, la corbusme et le jambon, avons et si longtemps, à sec de toile dans le gros temps. Valparaiso is not only part of the living memory of the Cape Horners, it incarnates the history of the Chilean Navy as well. After the War of the Pacific against Peru and Bolivia, the victorious Chilean Navy became back and they told us that they had found the Cape and the vast open sea. And the captain, overcome with joy, began to weep, and he named the Cape, Cape Desire, for it was desired so deeply and for so long. Wednesday, the 28th of November, 1520, we sailed out of the strait and into the Mar Pacifica. In the wake of Magellan, the southern tip of America was to become the scene of four centuries of incredible maritime adventures, marked by exploits as well as shipwrecks. In the 19th century, the men who sailed for Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego were no longer adventurers or explorers, but simple sailors in charge of handling the gigantic sailing ships loaded with wool, copper, or immigrants. These men were the Cape Horners. I'm a bit hesitant about what the title Cape Horner really means. For me, a Cape Horner is somebody who goes by sailing ship from east to west. I'd like to emphasize just how difficult it actually is to go from east to west, because you have the seas against you, the waves constantly from the west, from the Pacific, you're also sailing into headwinds. So you're up against all these elements. That took time and there were people who lost their lives at it. Victims of the hostile elements unleashed around Cape... He was, of course, a very brave seaman, an important navigator. His name has lived on down through the centuries, from 1520 down to the present day. Several centuries have gone by, and here you are talking to me in my cabin. But the man whose name you pronounced is still present in our memory. He lives on. On the other hand, uh, apart from Pigafetta, the Italian chronicler who embarked with him, we don't know anything at all about the brave men who were along with Magellan on his voyage. Monday, the Feast of St. Lawrence, August 10th, 1519. The army supplied with all that was necessary with a crew composed of 237 men from different nations aboard five ships were ready to cast off from the pier of Seville. Firing all our cannons, we sailed under only our foresail to the mouth of the Guadalquivir. This is how Antonio Pigafetta described his departure from Seville in the Old World on board Magellan's Carac. The 15th of December, 1519, the fleet reached Rio de Janeiro. Then, after a stopover of several months in the land of the Patagons, the Giants, Magellan came in sight of the strait. After sailing and having reached the 52nd degree of the previously mentioned Antarctic Sea, we, as if by miracle, came upon a strait that we call the Cape of the 11,000 Virgins. The captain sent two ships ahead, the San Antonio and the Conception, on reconnaissance to seek out the exit of the strait. They took three days to go and come to The men pray, sing, and drink to keep their fear at bay. They have but one thought in mind, to reach Valparaiso. Up until 1914, with the opening of the Panama Canal, when all of a sudden there was no more need for the long voyages around South America, Valparaiso incarnated the spirit and dreams of all the Cape Horners. Roused from its slumber by the sirens of the boats moored in the harbor, Valparaiso slowly emerges from the morning mists.
All during the 19th century, Valparaiso, the first port after rounding the Cape Horn, harbored hundreds of sailing ships. The town drew European captains, welcomed immigrants. It even became more important than Santiago, the capital of Chile, until it was abandoned in a far corner of the earth by the steamers that from 1914 on set their course for the Panama Canal. So Valparaiso, the Valley of Paradise, grew along with the activity of its port. The city's funiculars, often in a sorry state now, date back to those days. The inhabitants still use them to go home to their working class neighborhoods where once stood split.